Okay, we're rolling. All right. guys this is open walkie we have jeff tan with us co-hosting we got moose moose tell us about your life brother man uh thanks for having me um my name is michael bellardi uh it's my government name everybody knows me as moose um simple reason for that is is there's a lot of michaels out there in the industry and in the world i don't like being called mike or mikey and uh moose was a nickname i got when i was 18 so it's a whole lot easier for people to say moose on set than mike and have three other people getting a check into him so that's where that came from but uh originally from pennsylvania uh started in the industry when i was uh probably about 21 22. Uh, i originally started as a robotic camera operator um uh, then I moved into working in marketing for like different being a DP, shooting commercials, editing commercials. And uh, then I moved into being a first AD on features and commercials. So, so you, you've hit a lot of spots already because I met you as a first AC focus puller, which yep. is primarily what you do now, right? Yeah, that's it. That's 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 where I am. It's where I want to be. It's what I love to do. Um I left the AD world uh, because I just, I always felt like I was walking around with a target on my back. And uh, I, you know, it's true. You know, when you're a first AD on some of these narrative projects, man, you know, they don't have it easy. You know, all the people that are just, they're catering to, they're trying to do their job, but they're also trying to keep things organized. You know, they have some really tough guys that they really need to, to tough, tough people that they need to cater to between production and, you know, the director, the actors. I just, you know, I loved it. I was okay at it, but I realized that there were people better suited for it. I wanted to be liked. I wanted to enjoy my industry. I wanted to enjoy what I did. So I moved back in the camera department and I'm forever thankful. Nice. Great. Yeah. So why the name Moose? Like, was there something that, uh, <laughs> like, you know, uh, that you did or, uh, you know, you were known for, or was it just Moose? You know, I grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It's a it's an interesting town. You know, it's got a pretty decent, you know, blue collar lifestyle um, mixed with a little bit of a little bit of everything. But uh, I was dating a wonderful woman um, when I was 18 years old. And, you know, one morning she just kind of woke up. She's like, you know, you're like a big old moose. She goes, you're just you're just a big guy. People don't exactly know how to react to you. Like they think they want to approach you, but they don't. And, um, you know, she, and then she said I was kind of doof. And I guess uh, that's where she said that she said, you're like moose. You're just a big old moose. And she said it in front of a bunch of band members. And the band members thought that was, that's perfect. We're going to call is. you moose. And nice. it just happened. I, I, I think, I think the name fits you perfectly, man. And like in a good way too, not like, <laughs> uh, like that's moose. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> there needs no explanation yeah. once I hear that. Exactly. All right, great. Perfect. Exactly. I appreciate it. I mean, um, I, I think I enjoy it. All right, man. So you, you gave us a little history. Could you maybe tell us about what was one of your first projects in the TV film industry that you were really excited about or you're really into? So, I mean, you know, I mean, my first movie, I was 22 years old uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It was about a three hundred thousand dollar, you know, feature written by, you know, uh, a gentleman by the name of John Kilker, who was directing it. Um, the movie was fun. It was a good time. Um, that kind of set wave into like me being really interested in, in being in the narrative side of things. But my career really took off when I was, you know, in my in my mid 20s when uh, I got the opportunity to kind of um, camera PA and uh, second AC. And I was working with a gentleman by the name of Adam Gonzalez, who, you know, was a great guy. He, he oh. is a great guy. Um, I know Adam. Oh my God. I haven't heard yeah. him in a while. I know. Yeah. That's awesome. So Adam, Adam, you know, he, when we first met, it was, you know, two big guys that were roughly around the same age. You know, I had experience working in narrative and working on features and understanding what the camera department did. However, I was never in the position of just directly working in the camera department. So, you know, here I am getting forced in on, on Adam to be his, his second AC and, uh, day one, he wasn't too stoked. Yeah. You know, that, how'd that, that go? <laughs> <laughs> day one, you know, you could see it all over his face. He wasn't too stoked, but 
you know, by the end of day three, day four, you know, we had a rhythm. The B camera team had a rhythm and we were doing well. We hit it off. We became friends very quickly. And from there it was, it was, you know, it was, it was gangbusters, man. It was, it was, you know, we hung out, we were, we had four more weeks on that movie together. You know, we worked with a couple of other very talented ACs and right then and there, I made the decision, Hey, you know, I want to be an AC, a full-time AC. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of seconding with him, camera peeing on other jobs and, you know, I, things blossomed very quickly. I ended up firsting, you know, you know, three years after, after being a second AC, you know what I mean? You know, there's a lot of people out there that, that second a little bit longer, but focus pulling came very natural to me. And I have a knack for paying attention to distances. And I love that. I, I think it's something that I obsess about. It's the absolute piece of the puzzle that I click with. Cause I like absolute things. Math is, is something I like, I like to do a lot of. So I just enjoyed it. And you know, I've been focused pulling now for four years and it's, I've been enjoying it thoroughly. Very nice. I think, um, I think that's super interesting because you just said you connect with math a lot and I really don't connect with math a lot. And I, <laughs> Me neither. I've always been more on the creative side of things. Like, you know, I grew up drawing, painting and photography and not that I knew I wanted to work in the camera department. Like, I didn't know that till I started working and noticing how everything kind of pieced together on set. But it's, I always, I always really appreciate super technical people and people that do, like you just said, you're like, Oh, I connect to the math of it or I connect to the distance of it. Cause that's really just not how my brain works. So I find yeah, it same. Super, super interesting. That's why I got into this industry, but like you're, you, you guys' brains work different who click with that kind of like structure and stuff. And I can't even get there. No, I completely agree, man. I think that's the beauty of it. You know what I mean? Like we think about all these these TV shows, these movies that, you know, we all each respectively work on. Sometimes together we work on these shows. You know what I mean? Like I always tell people, you know, working in our industry, it's one thing to be a painter, to be a photographer, to be an artist, you know. You, you're the size of your team and the size of the people that are involved in in creating the outcome, creating the final piece is significantly smaller you know what i mean whereas you know working on a, a on a film or a tv show reality whatever it is there's so many people coming together which is very similar to that of the circus you have all these different people that you need to rely on creative and not and you know it's 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 a solid balance man you know you have gentlemen like yourself that have the, that have the knack for you know the eye balancing the image you know getting the right composition executing the right movement the right lead you know and then you have the guys in there that are just like we know how to help you make that happen we know how to help you make that easier you know how do we make the camera lighter how do we how do we get you from a to b safely to achieve your vision you know what i mean like all that stuff goes together it's just like when props and production design come together to make everything happen for the the background of the scene you know, when you have, you know, hair and makeup working together with wardrobe to get the right, you know, the right pieces of the puzzle to sell the right Victorian era, you know, attire and 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 look. You know, what I mean, and you have the technical people who know how to execute it and you have the people with the vision, you know, like it's 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 a huge thing. And explaining that to people, sometimes, you know, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, this is it, it, one person can't do it and it takes a team right. of all these different kind of minds to make it happen yeah right. people forget that this is a collaborative uh medium um there's again that's a good attitude to have a lot of people like i've read into people in my uh my career where everybody's just like uh, this is what i do and sorry this is how i do it and it's yeah. not a collaborative effort and then there and there's already a uh some tension and stuff like that so that's a great attitude to have man i love that yeah, dude. I mean, like the tension, the tension is, and thank you. You know, it's just, it's, it's an interesting world. And yeah, we do with a lot of different personalities for sure. Yeah. Personalities, egos, you know, uh, ideas, you know, sometimes you meet somebody that just has some of the craziest ideas and you're like, where did this person come from? Right. What, like, you right. know, what planet are they from? And like, sometimes the G, the ideas are ingenious and sometimes they scare the ever loving, the ever loving shit out of you. <laughs> You're like, what in the world? What in the world is that? But, or, or like, know, that, what did I get into by taking this job? <laughs> yeah. That yeah. Is we, there, <laughs> has there ever been a, uh, like a setup that you've encountered that, you know, 
like the director or the DP wanted like, uh, you know, four different distances and some camera moves that you had to like really calculate and stuff and were like kind of settle shit. So, so this is, I, I do think that every bit of us in this industry have a bit of a masochistic side. Um, you know, without a doubt, we, we enjoy the challenges. We enjoy the tortures of, of stress at some points when somebody says that, you know, this is going to be something insane. I am usually the first person that goes, all right, I'm here for it. Let's see what you nice. got. You know, it happened recently on a feature um, earlier this year, you know, uh, right before the strike happened. And um, I had actually just taken over for the A first um, who unfortunately needed to depart from the show. And there was an extremely talented team that was already set in place. And they put me right in the A role. I was very surprised. I was like, Okay, yeah. I mean, I have I, I'm a key on every show I usually work on, so it's interesting, you know. I was like, sure. Literally, day two, we were there, and they're breaking out a Luma two crane with dolly track for the Luma on a space head on a Venice shooting full frame six K, and you know, this is day two. This is day two for me. I'm like, oh, okay. I like, you know, I didn't get a. I didn't get the day out of days. I didn't know that that was what was coming. And all of a sudden, you know, EPS shows up and they go, where's a first. And I go, hi. And I go, what are you guys doing here? And then the crane is literally rolling in behind me as I'm having this conversation. That day was, you know, but we nailed it. And it was a stressful. Absolutely. My a operator, uh, Brendan Poutier, who is a fantastic operator, awesome steady cam guy. And um, he and I, we worked it out. We got the kinks out of it. And, you know, it came to fruition. And that was one of those times where it's like, this is bonkers. Mm-hmm. Are you crazy? He's like, you know, we, we want to do this on a 50 wide open. And you're like, okay, cool. <laughs> this will be interesting. And, you know, it was, what, did I have every reason to sit there and go, what in the world is this happening here? But we, we killed it. And th- those are the things to me that are the most accomplishing. They feel great. Aside from, you know, your team being happy and succeeding in what they're doing. Like, those are the moments that you're like, that are worth it for me at least. Nice. For um for some of the people that might not get all like the terminology that you're using and all just the the nuances of being on set in your exact position. So when you're a first AC or when you're managing a team, you're not only doing a technical job, but you're kind of working on logistics as well. Correct. Yeah. You want to explain yeah. that a little bit? Because you don't you almost have two, if not three jobs you're actually doing, but one, yeah, give me two titles. No, I, I, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it's the A camera first AC position is extremely interesting to me. Um, it is definitely a stressful position. Um, also the differences in understanding the dynamic between, you know, the first AC, the operator, and then you have the cinematographer DP, um, you know, the DP is, yes, essentially, like, you look at them and, like, they're like everybody will go, that, he's the, he or she is the boss, right? Or they're the boss. And it's it's very interesting because at the end of the day, are they the boss? Yes, but they're controlling so many other atmospheres. And then you have the A-first who is, you know, running a team of however many cameras and, and other ACs. And, and and the operators are, like, this this interesting liaison between the DP and us. They give us information but yet they show up, they do their job, and they're focused on the creative element, which is, you know, the two of you guys love that atmosphere. That's why I don't really bump up to operator too often. It's not my, it's not a, a huge ambition of mine. But, um, you know, managing the team and and getting things from A to B, you know, not only am I building a camera every day and getting it set up to the prerogative of an operator and the DP, I'm also focused on doing focus pulling, making sure the image sh- is sharp but also the phone calls from the producers having the sidebar conversations with the assistant director for anything that they need um, working tight with the production coordinator. And then that's where, you know, my assistant comes into play the second, the a camera second AC, the a camera second AC is in my opinion, the backbone of the entire operation. They handle nice. everything from time cards. They handle, they do handle some communication with production it went while I'm CC on that. But the A camera second is one of the most irreplaceable positions on any set at all whatsoever. They are, they, they have the mind to just deal with people 
even though I'm doing it as well, but they're also putting, they're making the gears move. It's, it's an unbelievable position. So yeah, the A camera first has, has a lot of hats, um, which is why I always say, you know, when I'm B camera and somebody comes to me with like a, like a, something that needs a decision or an important question, I go, "Hmm, that sounds like an A camera problem. I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, and and A camera looks at me and goes, you really need to embellish that. I'm like, B camera is one of the best positions on the planet. You know, if you're invited to be a B camera, a B camera first on a show or a movie, that means you are a very, very good focus puller. Sometimes I think the B camera focus puller is actually a more talented focus puller than the A camera at times. At times. Why, do you, why do you say that? B Just camera your gets, opinion. I mean, B camera typically gets stuck on a tighter lens. Hmm. You know what I mean? So, you know, while A camera may be shooting, you know, in dialogue, a 35 millimeter at 2.8, you know, your B camera might be rolling with a 75 at 2.8 sometimes more open depending on what lens set that they're running you know what i mean and you know those depth of fields are wildly different that b camera focus puller is literally there for one thing and that is to make sure the image is sharp because we all know some of these dps and some of these cinematographers out there they are looking and the directors as well are looking for those deep intimate scenes with the tighter angles and they always get the weird interesting shot too you know what i mean b camera is always out there doing something crazy and it, it's a fun position. And I understand why they get all the tighter shots is because they don't have a lot of the other responsibilities to worry about when it comes to, you know, managing and, and getting the information. You know, B camera is a, a cool spot. I mean, being A or B is just a luxury in general. Some people don't want to be A camera because they don't want to deal with the organization and the structuring of the team and, you know, any of the HR stuff, any, right. of, the, any of the stuff, you know, with all the meetings and the later conversations, you know, it happens. Like that. How do you find that uh, from your perspective? Was like, were you, did you work your way up? Cause you know, obviously, you know, we just met, but like, how did, did you work your way up from B like, you know, B to A or like second to first B to A or then, you know, things like that. Or like, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, I was a second AC for for a number of projects. Um, you know, more commercial side, uh, content creation. There are a few movies out there, a few features out there with me as a second AC credit. I don't know if they're actually credited, but I am there. Um, I worked my way through that, um, and then I started. Like I said, I moved into the into the the first position pretty quickly, and I would be first, absolutely. I learned from a lot of a lot of people, um, a lot of very talented people that have moved on in the industry in many different capacities. Um, a lot of a lot of people that have been taught by a lot of strict people as well. So, I mean, I do appreciate when I am C or B camera working under people who have done it longer and have different ways, different workflows, because that's the only way you're going to learn. Right. It's the best way to learn. Like, show me the guy who's been doing it for you know 15, 20 years longer than I have. I mean, they have a vat of knowledge that is so valuable to someone, someone like me who's, who wants to learn different ways of doing things and learning how to deal with different scenarios. You know what I mean? There's so many situations that arise on set that you have to navigate in so many different ways. You know what I mean? From safety right. concerns to, you know... Um, dealing with dealing with how how you're hiring people moving people into different positions as people leave you know the number in new york you know we hop on and off shows left and right you know i mean like you know you're working on a tier movie and somebody calls and says hey you know i need three days i got a commercial who's paying me three times my rate to be there people do that so you have to learn you know what's the proper way of finding the right replacement getting them the right paperwork you know yeah A lot of that stuff, uh, you know, a lot of people don't even uh, consider when they're in school and when everything like everybody thinks it's like creative and it's like lenses and cameras and and stuff like that. But, yeah, that's the stuff that, uh, you know, actually, to be honest, like I wish I learned more of back uh, in college. But, hey, shout out to the vets. Shout out to the seconds. I've never heard that before, actually. That's that's awesome that you, you know, you're saying that the the second your set, your assistant is the most important, uh, you know, position and stuff like that. I don't think I've ever heard that. But from uh, from your from uh, uh, first AC. So that's awesome. I mean, Shout yeah, I, 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 I can't see the interesting thing about the dichotomy of the camera department in general is that we can't succeed without each other. And it's built that way. It's designed that way. And it works right that way. 
you know, the loaders out there, man, some of these loaders out there that are these young 20 year olds that are loading film, 35 millimeter film. You know, I, I met one recently on a movie I was just working on. And this is, you know, these are irreplaceable people. You know what I mean? They're, they're irreplaceable. They are necessary to the success of the feature or the success of anything. You know what I mean? I'm so thankful for my seconds and loaders. And I think my seconds are extremely thankful for my loaders. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's without each other, everything falls apart and you can't forget that. It's not a, it's not a one person show on any stretch of the imagination. That's Agreed. a great mentality, man. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, all right. Even though I met you on an unscripted project, you mm -hmm. primarily do a lot of scripted projects. Yeah. You know, first AC. Do you want to dip into like what's going on into the industry right now? You want to talk about that at all? Man, it is. And everything. You know, right in a now, time here. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, it, I feel, I feel, I feel it. I mean, I feel it. I know you feel it. I know a number of people are feeling it. It's. Uh, it's a scary time. It's a scary time in narrative television and film. Um, it's scary for the writers. It's scary for the producers. It's scary for anyone in IATSE. Um, how do I feel? I probably feel the same way a lot of people in the music industry felt when Napster and you know the, the dissection of the music industry happened and it lost a lot to streaming. I think our unions and I think our representatives in our in our industry are working hard to make sure that we don't meet the same demise. I don't think we're going to meet the same demise, but I do have a lot of concerns. Um, I have a lot of concerns for our unions moving forward. Um, and I think I think we have to have each other's backs as best as we can. We can't lose sight of the bigger picture of unity at this time. That's the most important thing. We well, need sir. to stand behind each other and we need to make sure that we fight for what we believe in. We don't let corporate greed take over and we just get out there and, you know, we continue to chase our dreams and everybody who has entered the union and will in the foreseeable future join the union, they deserve the right to chase their dreams as well. So I'm not giving up on it. I don't think anybody else is at this point, but we still have a long road ahead of us. And I, you know, my fingers are crossed every day that, that we find some sort of way to solve this. I think, well, that, so, yeah. uh, I think that's very well put. I, I like your comparison to the music industry. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with you. I don't think knock on wood somewhere in, in this uh, office um, that I don't think it's going to go that way. I think there's, there's too many odds and ends connected to it. And, and the system is set up a little bit differently, but um, I think there is a lot of uncertainty going on right now. And with the, with all the union projects and all the strikes going on and, and a lot of people losing work, we are relying on a lot of people to negotiate on our behalf. And that is yeah. sometimes that's a little scary. So I think, I think a lot of people are feeling that right now. And what I've seen happen in the past, like in 2008, is one part of the industry affects the other. So because there's mainly scripted projects are being affected now, the unscripted world is being affected too. In 2008, it had kind of a positive effect. There were more unscripted projects being made. I don't really see that happening this time because I think with all the larger production companies and the tech affiliations and the conglomerates, I think everyone's kind of holding the purse real tight right now, which is affecting the whole industry. So it's, it's a super, super complicated, you can't even sum it up. And that's and, true. And, you know, it just, it, it's like every day there's something new happening and and, it, and we don't know what's going to happen next. So it's, it's kind of a well, that, that that brings me that brings me to to you know what, something that I really wanted to talk about because you yeah. know I, yeah. I'm I'm in the industry a little later a little later than you guys 2008 I was still in college so you know me entering this industry was you know a far cry I was still figuring that out where do you guys stand as far as what you saw in 2008 and what you're seeing right now in 2023. Oh, it's definitely different. I feel because you know, back in two thousand eight, the only thing that was really on was uh, like streaming wise was Netflix, and they were just mainly mainly acquiring 
a lot of scripted and building their catalog. They weren't really investing in like reality um, the same way that um, basic cable and networks were. So when there was the strike for the right, you know, when there was the writer strike, they heavily invested in reality because I think back then every five reality shows equaled one scripted. So they were just like hedging their bets. And that was a big push in the non-scripted series uh industry but this time it's completely different because uh you know they have a every streaming network has a backlog of uh, a lot of programming that either has been already made and people haven't watched yet because you could just scroll through netflix and these other you know other uh, streaming services and just find stuff that I, you know i even haven't even watched yet i'm like all right i guess i could watch this now since nothing new is coming out and they're kind of i feel they're kind of uh like you're saying uh holding on to the purse real tight because I think they're trying to draw it out. Unfortunately, it's you know it doesn't look good because it's they're just they can they can draw it out longer than uh, back in two thousand eight. So, um, but yeah, like we're saying, there's a lot of nuance that comes in with business, and um, I feel like you know just the, the way the industry is in general that uh, it's going to be very very different. And every day's you know there's a new uh, you know something new that pops up. So. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it doesn't look, but for in the meantime, for right now, it doesn't look that good for the summer, at least. Hopefully, the fall, something new will turn up, you know. But that's just my my, yeah, my perspective. I, yeah. I mean, I pretty much agree with everything you just said. I just think it's hard to compare the 2008 writer's strike to right now because of all the difference in technology. Like, like Tan just said, like Netflix was the only streaming service. And I don't, I don't even recall if their streaming app was up the same way at that time. Not um, the same. No, definitely. They, they might have still had DVDs you yeah, know, they being did. delivered. And again, I also remember I'm talking about union um, negotiations and discussions, like talking to some of the older members back then, they, they didn't even think Netflix was like a real thing. They, 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 and yeah. so just everything has changed so much where now from a perspective of an, someone in the audience watching, someone working a job, the streaming, the streamers or the streaming services seem to have a higher grasp on production when that just wasn't the case in 2008. They, it was such a small percentage of what was being made and watched when now it's the complete reverse. So. Again, it's also different because SAG is striking and the two haven't been on strike together since the 60s, I believe. So historically, that's right. a whole other set of yeah. problems, you know, maybe ultimate solutions. But it, it's just it's just a way different situation. And as I mentioned before, I think in 2008, just by chance, not that I ever purposely tried to just work on unscripted projects, um, but because of the position I was in at the time, th that's what kept coming up. And that did have to do with the writer strike. So there, there was more yeah. unscripted projects at that time because of the writer strike. And it just doesn't seem like that's the case now. So you, you brought up, I mean, the last point that you made there always intrigued me. And, and you and I have talked about this on on sets before together. That strike in 2008 and the fact that the high media at that time, the most common media that was being manufactured was reality. Do you think that that strike and that era, that time zone in which that strike happened was what shaped your career in the direction that you're in now? And was it the direction you intended to go? Oh, it definitely did for me. It catapulted um, me. <laughs> for me, at least my perspective from my career, it definitely catapulted me because I was working on a bunch of different things. Um, when I was in, when I was, what that? I was like 27, 28, uh, I was doing, I was in post, I was an editor, but then I was also an AC and I was also a shooter, but a, a, an AC for commercials, a shooter for reality and an editor for like just anything Comcast and NBC was thrown at me. Right. So, but when that strike happened, I remember, I very remember it distinctly my ac and my camera op uh like opportunities just skyrocketed so even not being by choice it was just like all the work was there and high paid work from back then in my perspective my career back then it was higher paid work so naturally i went that way um but yeah if i don't think 
I wonder, you know, that's a good question. I wonder if uh, that spread didn't happen, where I would have ended up. Yeah, I mean, it's v- very similar again. Um, at the time, it's like you're, you know, very often in this industry, you live paycheck to paycheck. And at that time, I definitely was. And so you take what opportunities uh, come up. And at that time, in 2008, I don't think unscripted content was the majority of what was being made, but it very quickly started yeah. going upward. And living in New York, the, a lot of it was just becoming available. And I was literally just going from job to job to job. So to answer your question, um, yeah, I do think that not altered my career, but gave a direction to my career for better or worse. I don't necessarily think it was a bad thing because I learned a I learned a lot of operating skills probably way sooner than I would have if I Damn. if I stuck just with scripted work. And also I I learned a lot of other things too about the industry, like union participation, negotiating on my behalf. Like I so but good or bad, it definitely shaped my career. And I think I actually kind of feel really bad for people that are just trying to get into the industry right now. And they're like, oh, this is how it is. Cause this, this is not how it's always going to be. Right. Well, yeah. This, I is, think it's that, this is a pivotal I, time in the industry where I agree. I think that's That's going to seem the sim, similar thing is going to happen to a lot of people in the industry as well. Uh, in that sort of like level, like this is kind of, kind of heard people in different aspects and also uh you know people will wind up who are, who enjoyed the last like five years will wind up trying to look for different things to kind of make do whether it be whether it is <clears throat> being content creation or even just this platform you know what i mean like yeah. doing this um yeah. people might you know uh shift their careers accordingly but yeah it'll be an interesting time the next couple years when hopefully the dust settles but uh yeah i think oh, it's man. gonna have an effect I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, not, not to throw, you know, a wet log on the fire here and be a, be a little bit of a downer, but you know, I'm watching friends lives change right before my eyes from, especially from the narrative side of things. Same. Oh, um, wow. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm watching people changing their careers, second guessing themselves. I'm, I'm, I'm watching, you know, like, like I said, you know, this industry, this industry is tough. It's, it's tough on us, you know, mentally, physically, personally, um it's it's definitely tough tough for relationships especially you know for you know people that don't want to have a partner that works 60 hour weeks 70 hour weeks away from home late nights all over the place and is coming home at all hours so you know uh it's a lot of people are i think the first couple months people were enjoying the strike and taking advantage of quality of life opportunity even though covid gave that as well um but I, I, you know, I, like I said, it, it's, it's a very big bummer to see, you know, a number of colleagues and people who are struggling right now. And I, I don't, I don't wish, I don't wish that I'm on anyone. I don't. So I'm hoping things do get better soon, but you know, it's, it's just interesting. You know what I mean? Like the reality TV circuits and the Navit circuits, you know, the IBEW circuits, like, the, like there's, there's a lot of different things happening. You know, sports is still going on. If you're lucky to have, have work in the sports market, local right. 100 here in New York, like, you know, we, do, we, we, we all have friends who are associated with the local 100 uh, atmosphere and, and, you know, they're still working, which is cool. Um, but it, you know, like I said, this, uh, this is a very prolific time for, for I, I, you know, it's hard for me to understand. And I'm, and I'm a young, I'm a young, I'm young in this industry. And I'm watching a lot of these younger people enter and they, they're coming in one door and they're going, oh, wow, that that's what this is like. Is this secure? Is this reliable? They're asking those questions, the questions that we probably asked and oh, we sure, yeah. still ask in our, in our, you know, in our, in our thirties and forties, you no, know, is this reliable? Is this sustainable? You know, but there, right. some of them are walking right in and going, oh, I'm going to go over here and do this, you know, I, right. and, and that's, you know, it is a it is a, a bummer because like even if you do try to uh, uh, understand it and you know if even if you'd read the trades and you know even like watch the business like channels and like you know just read all the stuff that uh, about the strike and what's going on and stuff like that even if you try to understand it you realize at least for mine you know what I've done is like I, I what I've realized is like I'm so like not like my 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 i'm so far removed from those decisions that are made so like far away um that affects all of us down here that even if 
you know, you try to understand, you're just like, oh, man, it's like such a bummer because like, you know, your colleagues are, uh, it has nothing to do with any of us. I, I mean, you know, like we're, we, you know, other than the fact that we could participate and support and, you know, just put our voices out there. Um, but yeah, it's just like, we're just working hard and doing our best at our jobs. And all of a sudden things happen, you know, mm-hmm. you know, take a downturn, you know, but um, That's, yeah, it's interesting perspective. Yeah, that, you know. Not to cut you off. Sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what keeps me sane, though. It's like all these decision making happenings or whatever are just they're out of my control and they're not being made by me. They're being made by large companies, essentially, and 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 union leadership to an extent. But, yeah, you know, you, think- you have you have probably possibly a couple of hundred people deciding the jobs of maybe 500,000 people, if not probably less than a couple hundred, <laughs> right, exactly, less than exactly. that, you know? Yeah. You, you get what I'm saying though. So, but yeah. I will say that if you take that comparison and then look at another industry, it's probably very similar. If you, you know, if you look at construction or shipping or yeah, the UPS other, that almost happened, any other large business where there's, a few companies that probably control that industry. Th- th- this is what happens with strikes. There's a large company that controls most of the industry that has the profit sharing that fronts all the money. And you have the laborers, which essentially we are, we're laborers, um, despite if we're getting paid well or not. And, you know, then there's disagreements, there's negotiations, there's strikes. There's resolution. Some people leave. Some people stay. It's kind of the well, nature of capitalism. It's 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 just what it is. A little yeah. bit, yeah, right. Um, but what what is I'm curious about your your perspective or like you know from from your part of the industry and stuff. Do people are people like how do I feel? Is it are people like in despair? Not not so much in despair, but like are they just are they trying to do other things? Like you know what I mean? Are they affected by where they're just like oh shit? I gotta I gotta adjust and adapt or i'm just gonna get you know i I'm, otherwise i'm just gonna get left behind or something like that because i feel and from my own like uh view is that you know right now is the time to kind of like see the landscape and kind of like adapt and kind of like you know just to kind of survive a little bit but i see a lot of other people uh colleagues and people i don't know like you know don't don't know personally who are just like holding fast and like hoping that things will go back to the way it was when i feel like it won't what is the what is the perspective on from from your genre side? You think? Uh, I mean, you know, from the I mean, from the narrative side, I mean, I, it's there's a there's a, there's there's a lot of things that are going up for sale. You know, a lot of owner operators are you know uh, are are you know separating their gear and and diversifying assets. Um, I haven't seen this many Preston and Fizz systems for sale in my entire career. Um, I actually picked one up in the last, uh, three, four months cause it was the right deal at the right time. Um, do I regret the purchase? No, but was the purchase at not at my favorite time to buy it? It wasn't, but it was a good deal. I had no choice. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's, I can't sit here and, and simply say that a lot of people are doing great when they're not. Um, I've just been seeing, like I said, a lot of things are up for sale. People are changing. They're moving. They're moving into different into different career paths. Um, there are a lot of mentors out there that are doing everything they can to help their mentees. But right now, how do you help a mentee when you're a person going through this this shock wave and one of the most intense strikes seen in 40, 50 years, you know, or even longer, maybe historically in ever. So um, the narrative side of the world, you know, some of my closest friends are full time on TV shows and they don't know when their shows are going to start up again at all. Oh, I see. You know, the, the, some of the shows that I've worked on, you know, they haven't received word as to when they're going to begin. That's terrifying. You know, a show that typically starts in August, September or October is sitting there going, uh oh. And, you know, you gave six, seven, eight, nine months to that show and you're planning on coming back to it. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of ACs and camera department people that, 
you know, if they do a nine month show or a six month show, you know, they can take three, four months off or a couple of months off, you know, do a couple projects in between, but there's no guarantee that that show is coming back in 2023. Now there's no guarantee that the show will come back at all, you know, for whatever reason, you know, things change in, in the structure of, of, of some chaos. Like this. like things are just hanging in the balance and that's, that's what's scary. You know what I mean? Um, I recently, I recently picked up a neighbor card. Uh, with ABC Disney. Uh, that is new for me. I've been eligible for it since 2019 uh, or no, excuse me, 2020, 2021. I was eligible for it. I got a call recently to go on a show and lo and behold, another focus puller is actually on the other side of the team doing the same thing that I did. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting here going, you know, I'm very, very blessed and lucky to have work, but it lives more in the reality side of things which you know i've done i've done a show a show with jeff two shows with jeff in reality Mm -hmm. and it's it's not a playground that i'm in very often but i was taught by some really good people jeff included you know what happens in that side of the industry so you know good leadership taught me how to do that and that's what i'm doing now and i'm very fortunate to have a job you know considering I mean, I haven't gotten a call for any sort of narrative work in three months. Yeah. That's, that's heavy. Yeah. That's, that's a lot to digest in general. I think um, in terms of you personally and in terms of advice I would give someone and I never like to limit myself. So the more I could learn to jump from different projects, I do neighbor jobs. I do live shows. I do one time a, a bunch of years back, I had a slow winter. The Today Show called me. I shot the Today Show for three weeks. And they probably would offer me a full-time job, but I was, again, that's not, that wasn't the direction I was trying to go. Uh, thank yeah. you, Today Show. But anyways, um, I think it's good to do what you're doing, Moose. Like, hey, if someone calls you and you can work for a couple of weeks, do it. Right. Yeah. It's Adapt, better. man, yeah. As as part of survival in this industry, it's there, there's peaks and valleys. Last year, I was just telling someone that doesn't work in industry. Last year, I had a really fortunate year. Just Same. you know, oh, yeah. year year ending. This year, not so much. Like I would almost compare this year to 2020, but without the unemployment benefits kicking. In. <laughs> like, oh right, yeah right. Yeah um yeah. yeah, it's just like there's way less projects. Am I? Am I still being picky with negotiating? Of course I am. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just think this is a a super tough year for everyone. And hey, we're not we're not going to solve it all right now. So let's talk about something better. Yeah, that was good, Um, though. We uh, I'm glad that we touched upon that. But like, yeah, let's move on to like. let's, let's, let's move on. Uh, Moose, why don't you talk about some of your other stuff you like doing? Back to you. I already, I already I already know some of these answers, but why don't you why don't you talk about like your love of bikes or something positive so we can <laughs> something keep it up positive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, behind the scenes, I finally learned to have a hobby. Um, you know, chasing the career is cool and all, and I love it. And I'm never going to stop. It's still priority one, but um motorcycles and motorcycles in new york city is is a is a hobby that i love um i grew up in pennsylvania so dirt bikes four wheelers all that fun jazz was out there side by sides are now the new trend unfortunately i don't own one but i I wish i will i wish i would but um harleys triumphs ducatis hondas i don't care i just i like being on two wheels um, I will sit here and I will say anybody who rides a motorcycle is an idiot. <laughs> it's not, you know, I will never be the guy who sits there and goes, Hey, you know what you should do? You should ride a motorcycle. I, I will never be that guy. I was guy. thinking about doing that actually, but maybe it's my midlife crisis coming up. So maybe I shouldn't, huh? I'm always the guy that says, listen, I think motor riding motorcycles is not the brightest thing to do, but I will never say do it. But if somebody's going to do it anyway, I will be the first person there to help out in any way that I can in educating, finding the right bike, teaching how to ride, making sure you have all the safety gear. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if you're going to you're going to do it anyway, I'd rather you do it with somebody who at least cares about you and knows what and knows what they're doing. That's 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 the moral of the story. Nice. So that's my hobby here. You know, your garage in Williamsburg and 
when I'm not working or hanging out with a friend, uh, that's where you can find me tinkering around with motors and stuff. Uh, to back it up a little bit further, like in life, like when did you, did you go to school for this, um, to, for film and TV? So sort of, um, I went to school at Marywood university in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a good university and they had a digital media and broadcasting communication side of things. Cool. So working in radio, working TV, I ended up working at my local news station for several years before I moved into marketing and, and shooting commercials. And, uh, I was on scholarship, you know, I had such a hard time with the philosophy of spending 90 plus thousand dollars to go to college for a degree. Um, especially for an undergrad degree. Uh, you know, I had an opportunity. I was, I had some people backing me to go to USC for film school and I chose not to. Right. And not, I, I think film school is a great thing for those people who work well in an education atmosphere who can learn that way. Uh, I am a guy who is very pro on showing up, learning the job, doing the job. And that's the best way you're going to figure out how to do it. On the job training. I dig it. Yeah. Yeah. So then you fell, did you fall in, like after you worked in the, like you said, your news television station or something like that? Yeah. How did you wind up getting into, you mentioned um, uh, Robocam and stuff? Yeah. So I was a robotic, I was hired right out of college, right? Actually, before I even graduated college as a robotic camera operator for my local oh, news station. W, yeah. WNEP, uh, ABC oh, okay. in, uh, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. It's actually one of, one of the biggest news stations in the country as far as counties, you know, served, but and it's a, it was a great, it was a great place to work. You know, it was baffling to me that I was graduating college and getting paid minimum wage to operate robotic camera. Hindsight. Yeah. I said that. I said that out loud. Yeah. That, it, it was baffling to me, you know, $7. I, th- I want to say maybe I was making $8 an hour operating robotic cameras for six or seven newscasts uh, a day on the wow. night shift. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then, you know, I needed to get out of there. Uh, news, unfortunately, is just not my, it's not my forte. Uh, it, it affects me a little too much. Um, okay. We all understand why. Oh yeah. I agree with that. Uh, when and how did you wind up in New York? Because now you live in New York. I started, I, I met a guy who had an agency. He started, he was working in movies. I started ADing, and then I just, I re- realistically, you know, meeting Adam Gonzalez and a number of the other people that I met in those years was, was how I ended up here. I had a fortunate, great group of mentors that really just gave gave me opportunities because I showed up every time and I did the best I could what I had. Did I fail at times? Absolutely. Was I not my best at times? Absolutely. But I had yes. some, I was very privileged to have some very talented individuals in my life. And, uh, I learned a lot from them and I fully intend to pass that same kind of technique on to the people that I have the opportunity to train as well. You know? Yeah. Shout out to the mentors. Yes. Yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, you, you have a great you have a great work ethic. Though. I've worked with you on a few jobs. Um, okay, we. I mean, again, like we. This is kind of a heavy uh, session here, but what advice would you give to someone just starting out in this industry? I know that's like a, kind of a loaded question right now. But yeah, especially at this point in time. Yeah. Like, someone that's like, I need to work in TV and film. That's what I've always wanted to do. Blah blah. blah. How do I do it? go patience poise attention to detail understand and respect your mentors or the people that have been doing it before you um if you have the ability to take critiques and then you have to have a tough set of you have to have tough skin you know if you were able to show up and learn and take critiques and take that information you're going to get far without hesitation, like without, you know, sound, you know, without being argumentative in any way, of course, you know, morality and, and being treated humanely is, is, is the best thing. Of course, you, that needs to happen. Don't, don't violate that. But, you know, 
you, you're learning the ways, the ways that this industry has existed and it is always improving. There are things that this industry has done wrong at times. We all know that, but, um, just keep on going. If you really want this bad enough, give it your best and don't stop. Don't get off the gas, keep going and just learn from the people who have been doing, doing it in front of you because Ooh, that. it's the best way, man. Stay positive, stay positive and be proud of yourself and just keep going. Damn right. Speaking of uh, staying positive, what, uh, what about you for like the future? Like, you know, non strike and everything notwithstanding, like, you know, like wh where do you see yourself or right, where do you want to head to? I, you know, I used to want to be a director of photography. That dream is not dead. It is not dead. Um, I very much enjoy being a focus puller. I, I, I want to be an A camera focus puller on bigger majors features is nice. really where I want to live and, and TV shows as well. You know what I mean? I love, I love my TV shows, my TV people. Um, that's it, man. You know, I, I other, I mean, I want to, I'm working on other atmospheres of my life as well. I have a little bit of an entrepreneurial side. That's where the math side of me comes from. I have some, some, you know, every single time I get ahead and I finally have the capital to invest, COVID happens or a strike happens. And then it's always going to happen. Everything. Yeah. So, but you know, I will eventually get to a point where I have other things going and that's a goal for me because I love this industry. I didn't get in this industry to be miserable. If I wanted to be miserable, I would have went and became the doctor. I would have went and became the lawyer, the politician, or the accountant. Yeah. And I, I, I don't. I get in this industry to have fun and to love what I do and to be proud of being a cog, a cog in all the gears that make something that people ultimately enjoy. Nice. What do you love so, best about this industry? The fact Personally. that my office. My, the fact that my office changes every day, the people that I interact with, I meet new people all the time. Yeah, and man. I learn something new every time. I have to be stimulated, man. I learn something new every single time I meet somebody new. You know, that's, that's are you right. kidding me? I mean, how, how much better? You're getting paid to meet new people and experience something new every single time. And some of the stuff that, I won't lie, man, some of the stuff that we get to do is just so darn cool. I mean, yes, does it remove the movie magic from our worlds? You know, like, how did they do that? Some of these people that, you know, when they watch TV shows, they don't understand how we did it, but we do. Yeah, but we do it. Mm -hmm. But we do it. And, and the magic is no longer trying to figure it out. The magic is learning how it can be done right. and experiencing the people who created it. Like, that's, that's, that's awesome, man, to be part of that. Like, I, I consider myself so lucky and, and so lucky to work for some of the people that I've ever worked with or for. Like. That's awesome, man. I don't yeah, know. That's, I'm that's the stuff. That's the stuff that you should tell the young people coming in the industry. Yeah. That's the stuff <laughs> right there, the sell. <laughs> I mean, it's great, man. I mean, like some do you make some of the best friends in the camaraderie of you know working in this industry. I mean, I met Jeff on a show. He and I have become, you know, pretty good friends. You know, we try to meet every month, go just go grab sandwiches because we we both have a love for like fancy Italian sandwiches at our local. Does he local go down to Bed Stuy from Astoria? Because he won't come to Williamsburg, nah. that's for sure. Because <laughs> if you go, know, yeah, I, I, owe you I owe you both a visit in Williamsburg Bed Stuy. That's fine. We can do All right. we can do sandwiches there next. I have a list. Yeah, you, you watch. Enough. He's gonna put it. He's gonna put it into one visit together, not two separate. He's gonna, yeah, he's gonna <laughs> want us to meet in Greenpoint. Now you, now you two know each other, so it's perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> nice. All right, uh, Moose. Like, you have any parting words, man? I think this was a great conversation. Yeah, I mean, I do. I I appreciate you both. You know, what I mean, taking the time to invite me to do this. Uh, I'm I'm so grateful for the opportunity. You know what I mean? I, you know, I hope we get to work together again soon. And, you know, thanks. You know, I, I, I implore you guys to keep going with this because this is, you know, a good way for all of us to kind of stay in touch and figure out our industry and navigate it all together, you know? Yeah, even if it just gives a little perspective, right? I mean, we're not, we're not solving the entire strike, but at least we get to give our perspective. So thanks for coming on, buddy. Cheers. Yeah, thank you guys for doing this. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, buddy. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to cut the roll, okay? Yeah. Hi everybody. You can, you can stay on them if you want. Yeah. How was it? Was that okay? Was that all right? No, no, no. I ain't cut yet.